Well, over the last five years, we've done the Ford, we've done the Mopar, we've done the Chevy and the Corvette, we did the aluminum car and the Cobra, we've done just about every make and model. Well, now finally the Pontiac guys have something to cheer about. 70 GTO Judge Convertible. Arguably the hottest new muscle car with prices on Ram Air 4 cars hitting $300,000 for a Judge Convertible. These cars are definitely getting some attention and some well-deserved attention. Well, the difference this year behind any of the other cars that we've done over the past few years is those cars have come in running, driving, complete cars. Even the Hemi, Hemi Challenger it needed restoration, but it was running and driving. Some of the other cars looked like they didn't even need restoration. Well, this one's come to us literally in baskets. It was in a restoration shop, or I should say a regular body shop for a number of years, sat in the corner. They started by stripping the car and just let it sit there. As far as parts go, the owner says everything's there. I'll tell you, I've never had a basket case where everything's there. There's always parts missing. The trick is finding out what's missing before you get too far into this thing. Let me show you some of the issues with the body panels. A typical mistake when guys start restorations is to get all excited and start stripping all the exterior panels. Now they didn't strip the inside of the panels and really what they've done here is they've left them to rot. And here's a big problem. Once this rust gets ingrained into the panel, it's our job now to try and get every little speck of rust out of it and that's a lot of work. If you're going to strip the exterior, make sure you put it into an epoxy primer instantly. Otherwise, you've created a ton of work. Every single body panel in this car needs to be re-stripped and make sure that every little bit of rust is out or it's going to come back to haunt us. Now let's go upstairs and have a look at the parts. There's a whole bunch of issues with getting the car literally in baskets. Well, welcome to the parts nightmare. Do we have a bunch of parts? Absolutely. We've got a transmission. It looks like the original one, but it looks like it's been in a barn for a number of years. We have all the sheet metal here, but is it the right sheet metal? We've got a bunch of suspension components. Great, we've got new parts, but they're not really NOS parts. This is going to be a concourse restoration. We can't use that. Whoever ordered it probably, you know, should have left it to us to order the original stuff or went to a company like Year One to get the original parts. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking your car to a regular body shop as this one started out but keep in mind if they get busy their bread and butter is going to be in the collision work there's some talented body men that are capable of doing this sort of work but again the owner is going to say geez you know it snowed last week we got a bunch of cars in they need to get out yours is going to sit that's what happened here the car sat for a couple years started rusting who knows where all the parts went we get it in a basket it's going to take a lot longer now there is one upside to getting a car in pieces well, the only advantage might be that we can actually see what the floors and the quarter panels and the chassis is like on this thing. We had a look at the frame and actually the frame we got going on already, we actually got that piece sandblasted and, and we're going to put the body back on this to make sure all the panels line up. It looks like a couple of the panels are reproduction panels. But Having a look in here, you can see floors, nice and solid. Trunk pans, nice and solid. There is some rust around the quarter panels that we're going to have to address. So that is the only advantage. And let me tell you this, I mean, it will take literally probably an extra two to 300 hours to do this restoration for the simple fact that we're not sure what we're starting with. We don't know what bolts are missing. We don't know what bolts are broken. We don't know what was broken. We didn't have an opportunity to run the motor. Is the motor just a piece of junk? Is the transmission junk? We won't know that until we go through it. It's really nice to do a restoration with everything complete. Remember all the episodes where we showed you how we organize everything, categorize everything, bag it, label it, put it on the shelf, decide what's good and what's not? Well, we don't have that option here. Now we're scrambling to find if we have all the parts. So what's going to happen here is it's going to take us a lot longer to do this restoration and it's going to cost the customer a whole bunch more. Well, over the years, we've shown you a bunch of different ways to strip a car. Sandblasting, probably the most popular. Also the most aggressive. Great for the frames, great for the undercarriage, great for around the window surround. Very aggressive at getting out all of the rust. Now, the exterior panels, you've got some issues. You can't be that aggressive because the heat from the sand is actually going to warp the panel. So you have to go to soda or you have to go to a plastic media. Both are great alternatives. Now the third one that we've never touched on is actually chemical stripping. Now with chemical stripping, the advantages are, for example, this hood we're going to send out is we can't get in between the cracks and crevices and you can see the rust happening here, you can see the rust happening here. We can't get in there with the sandblaster, we can't get in there with, with soda or any other media. So what we're going to have to do is dip the entire panel into a vat of chemical, it's going to strip it inside and out, make sure it comes 
out like brand new. I'm going to take you through all the steps and this is really the only alternative you have if you have rust in between two panels. The first step in the techno strip process is to actually strip the paint off the parts, in this case the GTO hood and trunk lid. They'll stay in the dip for between 15 to 45 minutes depending on how much paint is originally on these products. This organic based solvent also removes any of the leftover grease in the seams and anywhere else. When removed from the stripping tank, the pieces are now riddled with loosened paint and organic residue. A high pressure wash is used to remove all the residue and the paint chips. You can see them flake right off. The piece is now lifted and dipped into a light acid suitable for removing any rust without damaging the metal itself. This is a 10% acid solution that removes any rust, leftover bodywork, oxidization. The pieces will sit in here for anywhere between 15 and 2 hours depending on how rusty the panels are. Once removed from an acid dip, another high pressure rinse is used to remove any of the leftover rust debris and washes off any of the small traces of acid left. This pressure wash will take approximately 10 minutes to complete. The piece is now requires a dip in the hot caustic bin which contains 8 to 10 percent alkaline concentrate, neutralizing any acid left from the rust removal. The pieces will generally stay in this bin for between 15 to 30 minutes depending on how long it sat in the acid bin. Now the pieces are ready for a water dip, rinsing off any leftover alkaline traces. This last water rinse will take between 5 to 15 minutes. The pieces receive one last high pressure wash. This washing takes most of the time. Every crevice is inspected for remaining residue and washed down accordingly. This process is done by hand and can take up to an hour to complete. Now the piece is clean, a rust inhibitor spray will help prevent any future corrosion from taking place. This inhibitor sticks to the alkaline free surface when mixed with water. It's a water base. What we'll do now is when we get it back, we'll wash off this last rust inhibitor. Obviously you can't spray primer over top of that. We'll go over the whole thing with a thinner, we'll spray out all the seams, then we're ready for epoxy primer and then we're ready to start body work. Well, the metal work on this car wasn't very extensive. Actually, what we did here is you can see the outline of the weld here, and we put in this piece here. Now, we have the option of replacing the entire panel up at the pinch weld, but rather than replacing the entire panel, let's keep it to a minimum, keep as much of the original car as possible. For value later, it's important. All the gaps will be right, or all the door jam seams will be right, the top pinch welds will be right. With this repair here, nobody will ever be able to tell that anything's been done. So what I'll do is I'll take you through these steps. The first thing we're going to do is rough trim out the quarter panel. The rust has been removed and we're just going to clean up the edge. The patch has already been made so now it's a matter of fitting it, trimming the quarter panel and preparing it to butt weld in. This process will actually take longer than most people expect. It's a matter of fitting it, clamping it in place, making sure it fits the opening but also doesn't distort the panel by pulling. Using as many clamps as possible is important. Once we have all the clamps in place, we're ready to weld it. Keep in mind you're not going to run a solid bead from top to bottom. That's going to distort the panel. You're going to start at the top, you're going to work to the bottom, you're going to work back to the middle. You want to keep the heat as small as possible. As the heat distorts the panel slightly, you're going to constantly hammer and dolly the panel back into shape, tack it a little further, and once you have a tack about every inch in place, you're ready to fill in between the tack welds. Going back to the hammer and dolly to fix any distortion as it happens. Once the panel has been welded completely in place, now we're going to crush the weld. This will require less grinding in the end, and again, less distortion with the grinder or file, because that creates heat. Once the welds are crushed, we look for any pinholes or any cracking of the weld, and we want to make sure that's been repaired. Using a wet cloth once in a while will help actually help shrink the metal into place. Using the hammer and dolly will finish the repair so it's invisible. Now that that section of the quarter panel is finished, the next thing we have to get to is the door gaps. When the gap isn't correct, there's a few ways to repair it. The proper way to repair it is with steel on the edge of the door. First we have to clean the primer off so we can weld to the edge of the door. Then we're going to use a thick rod clamp it in place and actually extend the door about an eighth of an inch further than it normally would be. We'll start by using a MIG, we'll tack it into place and we'll tack weld it about every inch down the edge of the door. Once those tack welds have been completed, we'll use the gauge which is just a piece of metal 
to see if it's a, it's a no-go go gauge. If it goes in, that's the gap we want. If it doesn't go in, it's a little bit too tight. Now we're gonna use the TIG to fill in the spaces between the MIG spot welds. We'll grind all the welds off, and what we have is a solid edge of the door that we can now shape with the grinder. We're gonna use the, the tool, our gauge, and a marker to give us the rough shape of the door. Then we're gonna use a file and keep shaping the edge of the door. If we hadn't done this step, if we just filed the door skin, we'd eventually go through and split the skin. We've got a proper gap now that will last forever. Last week we showed you how to line up the door gaps. After that we have to bolt on the fenders, bolt on the hood, bolt on the bumpers, even though the bumper hasn't been stripped yet. Everything gets bolted and all the body work gets done as one unit. That way when you look down the side of it, it's nice and straight. Well, there's a bunch of steps you have to take first. First off, you have to do your rough body work. And then what we use is a sprayable polyester filler. And this is basically the equivalent of body filler, except it sprays on. This gives you the ability to build up the, the body, any waves in it, and then you use a bunch of different sandpapers and a bunch of different blocks to block it nice and straight. We start off with an aluminum block that doesn't have any give. We start off with a 120 grit sandpaper on that aluminum block. That kind of roughs out the shape of the car. This gives you the nice straight look down the side. From there, you get into some of your corners and, and your areas, and this block here, it's kind of interesting, has different rods in it. And what these rods allow you to do is make it stiffer or more flexible depending on the shape of the fender. Lastly, we go to a standard board file, which a lot of body shops will use. And this is a flexible board file with aluminum plate on the back, a little rubber. It has a little bit of give. So we're going to start out with the 120 grit paper. We're going to go to the 180 grit paper. We're going to continue off with the 220 grit paper with the different board files. Now the way you find out if it's straight or not is you use here a guide coat. You can use a spray bomb or you can use this stuff here. You put it all over the car and it'll allow you to sew the high and low spots, the sand scratches, and any other imperfections. Now the difference between a good restoration and a great restoration is all the fine details. Places that people generally don't look when they walk up to the car. It's in all the nooks and crannies, the bottom of the rockers, in the wheel wells. And that's where these things come in. They're really handy and they conform to the shape of that area and you can see that you've got in every nook and cranny. Now you see we still got a little low spot here. If this is painted with metallic, that's going to show up again. Now a lot of guys, they really don't care in the wheel well. But here if we're going to do it, you may as well do it right. Guide coat all the areas, sand all the air areas. This conforms nicely. You got a nice smooth finish here. You still got a couple of low spots there. You keep working it. And when all the guide coat's gone, it's perfect now. Now you can see here we've broken through to the epoxy primer and to the bare metal. Now that's why the last coat that goes on a car is epoxy primer again. It will seal everything that gets wet sanded. Now, like I said before, you want to do all the body work together. You want to finish it off as fine as 320 if you're going to have a black car or dark color car. The next stage is to put the entire car into epoxy, but next week what we're going to show you is this rubber front bumper, enduro bumper. These are a trick all onto their own. They're really tricky to get right. They're really tricky to make sure that none of the cracks come back to haunt you. It's super flexible, so I'll show you what it takes to make one of these right. Well, one of the unique items on a Pontiac right from 68 on up was this rubber bumper. Now this caused a lot of problems. Consider you get a little shot in the parking lot, yeah it absorbed a lot of the energy, but the rubber would actually start to crack and the paint would all crack. And you can have a close look at this bumper, you can see where all the paint is cracking. And that's not just coming from the paint itself, that's actually coming from cracks in the rubber. Well, there was a bunch of the obstacles Pontiac had to overcome. It's actually a mix of rubber and plastic, a type of urethane, maybe the first ABS type used in a production car. By 1971, like this bumper here, they realized that even though it absorbed energy, you still had problems with it cracking. Heat and all those sorts of things took their toll on large areas, so they started trying to shrink the area. This bumper here is off a 71 GTO Judge, a 455 that we're doing pretty rare car, it's got to be perfect. Well, let me take you through the steps. We've got enough bumpers here from cars that we're doing that we can show you in one simple step. Well, the first step is to use a rubber prep and actually wash down the entire surface so you can see all the checking and cracking. If you have a close inspection on it here, you can actually see 
where the rubber itself is cracked. So what we have to do here is we have to get rid of the crack in the rubber or in the urethane. There's two ways of doing that. You can start by sanding it. If it's not a very deep crack, you can just sand the entire area out. If it is a deep crack, you're gonna have to use a Dremel tool and you're to, actually gonna have to V out that area and put in a very special filler. Now this filler is a plastic, they call it plastic surgery. Okay, I won't even make cracks about Tom using this stuff here. It's super flexible and it's designed exactly for this. It's made by Dominion Sure Seal and it's a great product for fixing cracks, but it's also a great product if you're doing a show car. Well, if you live somewhere where it's stinking hot in the summer and freezing cold in the winter, like up here, it takes its toll on these Enduro bumpers. So what we have to do is actually put a skim over the entire bumper and make it nice and straight again. The only al other alternative is to buy a new bumper, really not available, so you're finding a used one. Once you've got all the filler work done with this super flexible filler, it's time to prime it. You can't just prime it. This is one time epoxy primer just won't work. It's not flexible enough. What we have to use is actually a high build primer. Glazerit's got your regular high build, but you have to add a ton of flex agent in it. What happens is it slows down the whole process, makes everything very rubbery. Now the problem with that is also difficult to work with. You can see after it's primed, it's very shiny. Usually primer isn't this shiny. It also takes a, a long time before you can start sanding it. Once you start sanding it, it tends to ball up the, on, onto the sandpaper. And even now, when you've got a little pinhole, you'll have to use Polyflex again, which is a super flexible spot putty. Once that's done, again, sand down the whole thing, 240, 320, put on your last coat of high build, again with the flex agent. Now, if you're gonna paint this, don't just paint over top of all this flexible primer and all the, these very flexible products. When you're ready to paint, you also have to add flex agent into your paint. Otherwise, the first time you tap the front or even bolt the bumper up against the fenders, it's gonna all start to crack. Remember, Enduro bumper, great idea. First of the low impact bumpers um, work great, but if you don't prep it properly, it'll be a nightmare. Who would have thought that in some aspects, restoring a 330 Ferrari would be easier than restoring a Pontiac GTO? Well, when it comes out to blacking out the undercarriage in the engine bay of one of these cars, it's fairly straightforward. The entire engine bay, all the wheel wells, all the back area, the trunk, all go black. Then undercoating gets applied in a certain area. Well, when you're restoring a Pontiac GTO, that's a different story. There's a whole bunch of different blacks as far as Pontiac was concerned, depending what supplier supplied what part. Well, in talking about the black, there's three different issues. One is the shade of black, which would mean is it charcoal black or is it a real deep black? Second is the amount of gloss. Is it semi-gloss, is it flat, is it, is it totally gloss? Well, when you're talking about a chassis, usually you think of a semi-gloss or a chassis or a rally black. Well, that's right, but it's also wrong. There's four different degrees of semi-gloss black. Let me go through those. If you have a look here, we've done a spray out card and you've got basically your flat black, which isn't quite flat. You've got your regular semi-gloss. You've got a slightly shinier black, and then you've got a totally gloss black. Now there's, there's places for each one of these colors on a restoration. Generally what's accepted is the frame is sort of the third degree of shininess. You want the undercarriage of the car, the and underside of the hood, is a little bit duller than that. Sometimes when you get into suspension components, uh, like the A-arms, you can see here, we've taken an A-arm, and this one's in primer, and this is an original one with the GM sticker on, and you can see the different degree of gloss, so when we paint this, we're gonna try and match it as closely to the original part as possible. Now, keep one thing in mind, there is no super correct answer. Yeah, there are different shades, but depending what manufacturer, what sub-supplier to GM supplied that part, it could be different from week to week, it could be different from car to car. So there is no 100% correct answer, but there are different shades that you're gonna see throughout the restoration of one of these cars. One of the other things you're gonna notice is how the paint was applied. Well, the chassis it was obviously sprayed. The undercarriage of the car it was obviously sprayed. But some of the smaller parts, the brackets in that were actually dipped. And you can see how it draws differently. After it's dipped and pulled out of that, you can see actually where it draws. And sometimes there'll be runs on the edge of this area and heavy buildup here. And you can tell that part's been dipped. Now, it's actually a really effective, cheap, easy way to restore parts, and it's correct. What we do is we get a five gallon drum of the correct color or texture of black, and you just simply dip it in. Make sure you move it around so there's no air pockets. Let the majority of it roll off. 
Make sure you have something underneath to catch the residual and you're done. You can go through, you can see in the box here, when you've got 20, 30 little items, it'd be a real pain to actually take them out, spray them, hang them up. This way here, it's nice and quick, it's easy, and best of all, it's correct. Well, the last thing we're going to do is, depending on how parts were originally prepared or hung, there's different patterns of paint on it. I'll take you to the 70 hood and explain that as well. Well, sometimes there's a pattern on the black, and that's from the overspray of when this car was painted. Originally at the factory, the hoods were hung, and there's a bracket that held the hood in place. The white overspray would come around the front, and it would leave a spot right here that would be black with a little bit of overspray around the front. Typically, a GTO didn't have any overspray down the side or the back. It was just where they were trying to cover this front section that you would get a little bit on the black. Well, when you're doing black undercarriage, the frame, the suspension, there's no absolute right or wrong. There's different shades, there's different colors, and there's different degrees of gloss. Do your research, talk to the guys that are the judges, because ultimately they have the final say. We're just about ready to paint the 70 Judge convertible, Orbit Orange. Well, can you imagine today getting away with Orbit Orange, Sassy Grass Green, Plum Crazy Purple, Panther Pink? Ah, Tom's favorite color, I guess. Well. What BASF has been able to do is, as a rule, GMs were painted in lacquer, Fords were painted in enamel, Chryslers were painted in enamel. What they've done is they've taken all those original colors, converted them to base clears and acrylic enamels. It's great today. We can phone them up, say we want Orbit Orange, and they've got it on a disc here for us, ready to spray. That way, all the colors are accurate. Now, going back to the way these cars were originally painted, they were done in enamel. How do you tell if a car today is enamel? Let me go through it with you. Well, if you've ever wondered when you bought a car, if it was lacquer, or if you're going to repair a car, there's a quick, easy test. Take a little bit of lacquer thinner, put it on a rag. Now, be quick with this, rub it on, and wipe it off. And what happens is the color will actually come off on the rag, but more importantly, you can see it actually reactivate the lacquer and it becomes gummy. So don't do this for very long, you'll take your lacquer right off. Now lacquer had its place and it's got its good points. It's great for blow-ins, it's easy to polish, you can get tremendous finish with it. The downside was is it would crack, it would check, it wasn't good with temperature changes and it wasn't good for your health when you were spraying it. The enamels Ford went with had their good and bad points as well. The customer that we're restoring this 65R model for wanted it exactly the way it left the factory. We had to spray it in enamel. There's no clear on this. We had to spray the stripes in enamel. There's no clear on them as well. Now the downside to enamels, it's fairly thick. You can feel all the edges. You can actually see some orange peel on it. The lacquers you could buff out and give you that great show car sort of finish. Well, if you're going to restore one exactly back to original like this fellow wants here, you got to use enamel. So somebody comes up, they rub it, white comes off, blue comes off, they know it's an original enamel job. Well, now that we know the difference between lacquer and enamel, remember lacquer is thermoplastic, which means it uses a solvent or the escape of the solvent for it to dry. So thermal set is everything else, and it's a chemical reaction that actually cures the paint. That's why lacquer cracks. It's constantly drying. Well, getting back to the base clears that we're going to use on the Orbit Orange car, and on this car here, a 71 Judge convertible, this car here happens to be a metallic color. It's tropical lime problem with tropical line it's a light green color it's got a light metallic flake you have to prep it differently than a solid color if you're doing a solid color you can start with 400 grit go to 600 grit you're ready to spray if you're doing a metallic color especially a light metallic you got to take it to 800 grit it's another step but what will happen is if you don't do that you'll see all these fine little scratches in the paint that's kind of underneath the paint this is a step you have to do if you're doing metallic colors if you're doing them right well, now that we've gone through all the different paints, you want to make sure that you get the paint applied properly. One of the things we do here is we add four to five coats of clear, and what we're trying to do is build that up so later when we sand and polish it, you have that perfect finish. Well, make sure you leave the fan running for two to three hours with the heat turned on, otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to get some solvent popping. Tell the guy paint your car if you're asking him to load up the clear so you can cut and polish it to do that for you. Might cost you a little bit more, well worth it in the end. Well, Teddy, Lou, and Chris here at Legendary Motor Car have been hard at work getting the drivetrain into this chassis for the 70 GTO Judge. Well, when you're detailing a motor, it comes back from the engine builder. First thing we would do is degrease it. 
Now, the factory would have probably used the spray bomb, which isn't very pretty to look at. What we're doing here, because this is a show car, is Glazerit's come up with a proper Pontiac color. We're spraying it out of a gun. Goes in the booth, gets done properly. Now, the original WS code, which this car is here with a stick, a Ram Air 3. You can see the original numbers here in the block. They're very faint, but they are here. Those would match the VIN number. As far as detail items, there's lots of little things. Hardware, for example. These studs were used only on air cars, but all Ram Air 3, 4 cars, it's correct to have them here because they were the only ones used, period. Now, as far as the differences between a Ram Air 3 and a Ram Air 4, the air breather looks very similar, but you have a preheater tube that comes down from the exhaust manifold up into here. On a Ram Air 4 car, it's on both sides here. Ram Air 4, again, has this piece here. It's hand-formed. This one's metal stamped. Now, as far as the brackets go, you remember how we dipped them? Those are all correct. The overspray on the bell housing, that would be correct. Keep in mind, they were sprayed originally together as one unit. Now let's go to the rear end, and we'll show you some detailed sections on the rear end. Well, this car here comes with a 10-bolt. It's a Ram Air 3 car. It wasn't until late in 1970 that the 455 came out that the 12-bolt was mandatory. Well, this here is a bolt-in style axle as opposed to a C-clip, more like a Ford rear end. Now, as far as gear ratios went, you could get a 331, a 355, a 390, or a 433, depending what transmission option you had. Now, as far as detailing one of these, they all started out with natural axle tubes, obviously the caster end, the natural backing plate. Now what happened was it was totally installed like this and you can see all the brake lines have been detailed, all the paper tags that would have left the factory are on this car for the springs, the rear axle itself and uh, all the brake lines. Now a lot of these would have rotted away very quickly. A lot of them are just paper tags. So one winter once out in the rain, they'd be gone. Now, after the body is lowered down on this, there's a blackout procedure that happens back here, and literally they just kind of painted all over this to try and make it black so it wouldn't look quite as shiny underneath. Now, how about the transmission? That's another story. Now, this car came with the DJ training, and the tag tells us that, and what that means, it was a wide ratio, which means the rear end gear ratio was a 355. Now, the difference between an M20 and an M21 is the close and wide ratio, and what that just means is first gear actually on a wide ratio is a better gear to get out of the hole. On a close ratio, all the gears are stacked a little closer. So if you go from first to second, the RPM drop is consistent as from second to third, which is consistent as from third to fourth, which is a great road racing transmission, but out of the hole, it isn't quite as good. And that's why an M21 or an M22 transmission, they opted for a higher rear end gear ratio. Now, the wide ratio, great street transmission. Out of the hole, lots of grunt. Second gear, lots of grunt. Third gear, lots. And then you've got a big difference because it goes from a 1.48 ratio down to a 1 to 1 when it's in fourth gear. With a close ratio box, you go from a 1.28 ratio to 1, so you get less of a big gap in between third and fourth gear. Now, the difference between everybody asks, what is a rock crusher? Well, it's basically the internals. It's a close ratio box, very similar to an M21. Now, the difference is on the pitch of the gear. You can see here that a rock crusher gear has less of a pitch than an M21 gear. What that does is reduces some of the load on the thrust washer through the counter gear. And what happens is you can feel it or hear it clunking back and forth. Now on a Trans Am race car, they're almost straight cut gears or are straight cut gears and you hear that beautiful growl. That's why they call them a rock crusher. It's got that noise that this one here doesn't produce. Both are close ratio boxes, both are similar boxes. This one's a little tougher, better road racing transmission box. Well, that's pretty much the detail items. The other item you want to check on your tranny if you're doing a concourse restoration is you want to have the numbers, which this one does, original transmission, which matches the serial number to this car. As far as detailing goes, it's an aluminum piece. We put it in with some walnut shells, blast it, comes up mint, looks like brand new. Don't sandblast one of these, it'll be a little bit too coarse. That's pretty much all of the detail work as far as drivetrain goes on the 70 Judge. Well, we're back here at Legendary Motor Car. Now that the chassis is all done, body's all painted, we're ready to mate the two. Pretty simple procedure. 12 mounting places, bolts go through into the body. Now the trick is, you don't just lower it down and start reefing it down. You're actually going to use shims now because what we have to do is we have to lower the body perfectly square on the chassis. We don't want to scrape any of the rocker panels. Once it's lowered down there, we're going to start 
in the front. We're going to mount those bolts. We're going to put them through into the body. Now in the rear, we can use shims and we can actually lift the back of the car up and change the door gap open and closed. I'm going to show you in a minute what I mean by that when we lower the body down. Let's get to it first. Well, now that we've got it set down on the frame on the mounts, but with no bolts in it, I'm going to show you what happens if you shim it up and down. Go ahead, Chris, lift the back. And you can see how the door gap is opening and closing as he lifts and pushes down. So what's real important here, especially with a convertible, is you want to put all of the bolts in, check your gap, make sure they're all torqued down properly, and then decide if you're going to do shims. So the next step is for, uh, to put in all 12 bolts and see what we've got. All right, now you can see that the door is actually a little bit above the quarter panel, but keep in mind we don't have any, um, this car has power windows, so we don't have the motors in there, we don't have the glass in there. If you put a little bit of pressure on here, you can see it line up perfectly with the quarter panel. Now this is the most important gap on the car, this back gap and the rocker gap. You can't change the quarter panel gap. So if this isn't right, you start lining up the fenders and the hood to a wrong gap back here, it's all off. Take a little bit of time, make sure that the body's torqued down, make sure that this gap you're happy with before you start progressing on to the rest. Well worth it. Now we'll bolt on the fenders and the hood. Once the doors are lined up to the quarter panel, you're going to keep working forward. The next thing is the fender. Well, what you want to do is make sure you start with the fender up against the door and you don't want it to bind, so leave the front hanging loose. Once you've got that gap real nice, then you can put shims underneath the front against the rad cradle and make sure that it's not binding. You don't want to push down on it. Now, one little trick. You do all this with the wheels on the ground, all the weight on the car. But the one trick that where you want to jack it up is actually the urethane front bumper. If you have the car jacked up, you'll find that the urethane will move around from the fender. If you then tighten it up snug or as snug as you can with it in the air, once it comes down, that gap will close up real nice. It'll be nice and tight. One last tip is if you use a plastic washer underneath your bolts, as you're adjusting it, you're constantly reefing down the bolt, loosening it off, moving it around. If you don't have this underneath, you're going to scratch the paint. Have this underneath, it's going to save the paint. When it's all set, pull out the bolt, take out your washer, reef it down one last time. Well, today the guys at Legendary Motor Car are starting to sand and polish this GTO Judge convertible. Now, a lot of people ask, why do you sand down a perfectly good paint job? Let me explain it to you. No matter who's painting it, I don't care if it's the best painter in the world, it comes out of the gun with orange peel. So what we're going to do is we're going to sand all that peel right out of it, and what we're going to use is aluminum block. Now, the reason we use an aluminum block is because we spend a lot of time making sure the body is perfectly flat. Don't want to ruin it at this stage. The steps are, you're going to start with 800, you're going to go to 1200, 1500, 2000 grit paper. Sounds time consuming? It really is. Now, Norton's come up with a system we're going to use on the bottom half of the car or in the rocker panel area because it's not as important. And if you're doing a nice paint job that isn't got to be show, show quality, you can use this system. What happens, knock on wood, if we get a chip in this, how do we repair it? Well, Norton's got a system for that as well. Well, once the blow-in's been done, the trick is to make the repair invisible. Old paint, new paint, hazy in between. So what do we do? Norton's come up with this system. It's a spot repair system that gives you everything in one bag to finish this car. We'll start off with some 50, or actually 2,500 grit sandpaper. Just lightly go over the surface just to take out the imperfections and to start your blend. Now what you want to use is a compound and a wool pad, which is fairly aggressive, okay, and we'll use a fairly aggressive compound as well. The trick here is to go slow, make sure you keep it wet, and always run off of the blend so you don't rip into the new paint. Now the other nice thing about the spot repair kit is it's just that. You wouldn't polish the entire car with this small, small disc, but it's great for going around things like this headlight, where with the big pad you'd be in trouble. Okay, now we're ready to go to a less aggressive pad, which is a foam pad, and a less aggressive compound we're into the fine abrasive. Now the nice thing is this kit, literally has everything you need from A to Z to do this repair.
Now, as you can see, that blend line has completely gone away and the repair is invisible. Now, how does that help you at home? Well, Norton's got a system for small touch-ups for you to do yourself. Now, there is a spot repair that you can do at home. Like any chip, what we have to do is fill that chip with paint. So if this is your little valley here that the stone's taken out, fill that till it's level with paint. Start with a small touch-up brush, paint on a tin. It might require a few applications to get the touch-up paint built up above and beyond the existing paint. Once you're at that stage like we are now, make sure you let it dry because if you start to sand that touch-up paint while it's still a little bit uh, sticky or spongy, it's going to rip it right out of the hole again. Now typically when you've got your touch-up finished and it's dried, you've got this little blob here. Now, it's filled in the crater, it looks better than it did before, but how do you get rid of it? Well, Norton's got this miniature version that they sell to the public of it, what I just showed you. Comes with two different grit sandpapers, which you're gonna do by hand instead of with a machine. And what we're doing is actually sanding down that blob of paint. Now you can see your repairs disappeared. We're ready to start polishing. Now they've got two different grit sandpapers. They've got a mini wool pad just like we used on the other car. And they've got two compounds. And you're just going to do exactly what we did with the machine except by hand. This is a coarse compound with a coarse wool pad. You can see your repair has disappeared and it's still a little hazy so what we're going to do is go to a finer foam pad and we're going to go to a finishing compound. And this actually is colored so it'll actually help hide any fine imperfections. Now the kit comes with four different pads, two different compounds, two different grit sandpapers, and this little handheld thing that everything attaches to. So you can do it at home, do it in the garage. You got a perfect repair for your little stone chips. Well, Gary from Diamond Trim has been hard at work on this 70 GTO Judge convertible. He's done a great job of the upholstery, the convertible top, done our upholstery for about 20 years. Now, when you go to year one, you can order two different panels. You can order the pre-assembled panel or you can order the unassembled panel. Depending what you want to do with the car is going to make up your decision on what you're going to order. It's going to require a lot of work and it's going to require a professional like Gary who's going to take us through the steps and what it exactly is involved in doing an unassembled panel. Peter, basically the unassembled panel is a little cheaper to buy in the beginning, but a little more labor intense to put back together. But the way you put it back together will make all the difference as far as judging goes. If um, they're looking for particular staple installations, whether they're four inches and three inches apart, stuff like that. Uh, basically what we started with was we would take out the hard metal rails that are in the top rails of the door panels. Um, that would require just breaking them off of the panel board and cleaning them up, painting them, removing all the anti-rattlers and uh, installing them onto the unassembled panel. Okay, now, now an original panel would come with steel and one of the, the pre-assembled panel would come with a fiberglass insert or a plastic insert, I should say. Yes. For concourse quality, you, you prefer the steel panel. Oh, absolutely, I would go with the steel. The radius on the top of the panels is very important for keeping the panel tight to the seals on the top of the door. So if you have the metal in there, they tend to last a little bit longer and they'll look better, a little more rigid. I'm always wondering how you attach this cardboard to the steel panel. Basically, taking this panel apart, uh, we would very carefully measure for the height from the top of the, the radius up here to the panel. It has to be bang on or else, like I said, you're going to get gapping in the top and bottom and that'll cause holes like this one to be misaligned and cause you big problems. Basically, we would locate it, uh, drill right through, we would peen rivets onto it, and then machine the rivets down so that they're flush mounting so they don't interfere with mounting the panel. Okay, now you have to take the material and wrap it around the top. Is that yep. pretty straightforward? Yeah, pretty much, that's pretty basic. Uh, a heat gun, warm up the vinyl, it gets pulled around and glued across the top rail. Okay, you're not gluing it on, on this portion no, of it? No, no. Because it's going to get lumpy? Exactly, yes. Right. And what about the, the final weather strip? Final weather strip is basically, if you take some time, you can actually measure the old ones, and you can find where the staples were and uh, locate them in the original spots. Um, General Motors, on this particular one, used about six staples in these. Drill the two holes, put, the, put a new staple in, and if you want, touch it up with a little bit of paint so you can't see them. Um, I've seen a lot done with rivets up here, which looks really bad. It's not correct. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now, what about the, uh, the moldings themselves? You're taking a set of NOS moldings and putting them in. They're straightforward to install? Um, basically, yeah. The moldings that you... 
the NOS moldings that you get will install very easy. Put them in, peen them over on the back, uh, make sure they're polished so you don't have to get into polishing while they're on the panel. Pretty, pretty easy to install. Well, it sounds like a lot of work to take an unassembled panel and make it perfect, and it is, and that's why we have a guy like Gary doing it. Now, the convertible top, it's even more complicated. Let's not go there as far as we've showed you how to install a, a top on the L88 Corvette a couple years ago, but there's a few tricks for wrinkles and a few tricks that you can do when your top's down that can help sort out those problems. What are those? Basically, Peter, if you leave your top down for more than 24 hours, um, you are going to get some wrinkles in it. Uh, if you put your top in the upright position or if you even store it at night, you don't have to latch it right up, but just put it in the upright position and leave it like that. It's better than leaving it down. But if you do get some nasty wrinkles in it, you can take a heat gun, make sure you're good Far distance, away. <laughs> good distance away in order not to leave any shiny marks on the top. And just warm it gradually. Keep it on low heat. Hair dryer might even work Hair a little dryer, less heat. Yeah. yeah. Take a little longer, but it'll work too. Okay. So that basically wraps up what we did with the interior or the tricky items. We also did, of course, the, the carpets, we did the seat covers, we did the dash panels. Basically, we're going to dye all the hard plastic panels, being the dash, the skirts on the seats, the hardbacks on the seats. These are all going to be dyed to match the tone of the vinyl of uh, the seat installation kit so that everything has the same hue. Well, today's trim and detail day here at Legendary Motor Car, and the work on the 70 Judge Convertible, it's continuing to the point where it's all the nice, fun stuff to install. Well, there's some issues. We try and buy as many pieces as we can that are NOS pieces, but there are some items that you're better off to go to somebody like Year One for. Things like carpets, the seat upholstery, the convertible top, the weather strips. Let's face it, if you found those in a box NOS somewhere, Odds are slim to none that you're going to find them. Secondly, they're going to be through the roof. And third, they probably won't even look as good as some of the reproduction items out there, like a convertible top, like an upholstery kit. Some of your viewers have also written in and said, hey, you guys are cheating. You're right. We were working on three cars at the same time, and sometimes we showed you process from one car. We're working on a 71 Judge Convertible, super rare car, one of 17 built. We we're working on the 70 Judge Convertible, and we we're also working on a 70 GTO Convertible. Well, getting back to one of those items that really just doesn't work to buy NOS is the decal kit, the stripe package, the little Judge emblem. Even if you were able to find one on the shelf somewhere, the odds of getting it installed the odds of it sticking properly are slim to none. So what's the trick in putting on a decal kit? Let me take you through the steps. As far as the judge convertible, that's something that you could do in your, your own driveway at your own house. It's fairly basic, it's fairly simple. But if you get into a big decal like on the front of a 74 SD Trans Am car that we've got in the showroom, you probably want to go to a professional well worth the time and the effort. The first step in applying the decal is to make sure the surface is clean, wax-free, oil-free, and free of any other contaminants that would hurt the adhesion of the decal. The second step is placement of the decal. Measuring the center line of the hood, we want to make sure that the bird is absolutely in the center of the hood. After that, we're going to use just masking tape to hold it in place as we work one side at a time. Now we can peel the decal away from the backing. It's ready to be applied to the hood, but before we can do that, we'll have to trim away the backing. Now you're going to spray it with a solution, 50% alcohol, 50% water, and maybe a drop of dish soap. That'll help promote a slippery surface so you can get rid of air, all of the air pockets. Be careful to lower it down, use a squeegee, and firmly push from the center out to get rid of all the air pockets. You're going to take the top masking off and your bird will be installed perfectly the first time. Well, it looks relatively easy and it is on the smaller decals. Just take your time, make sure you work out all of the wrinkles. Try not to get any wrinkles in the first place. Make sure you work out all of the air pockets, squeeze them out to the side. For the big decals, hire in the professionals. We do, well worth the extra expense. Now that the guys at Legendary Motor Car have finished restoring this car to as near perfection as you're going to get, it's time to take it off to the car shows. Now let's reiterate, when we started this project, we said it's coming in basket, it's going to take a lot of time. Well, here's the thing, if you're looking at a restoration and it starts out as a basket case, expect to spend more time. Here's why. You start pulling the pieces out of the boxes and you're not sure if you've got that certain item you're trying to bolt on. You spend four hours looking for the item before you realize you don't have it. Now you gotta wait, you gotta order it. 
So doing a basket case, it's gonna take an extreme amount of time compared to a car that's already together. If we disassemble a car or any restoration shop disassembles a car, they know what they've got before they get started and they can make a list of what they need as they put it away. A lot simpler, a lot less money for you guys in the long run. Well, there's a bunch of things you wanna do with a car once it's restored. Some guys wanna drive them, some guys wanna park them in the garage, and some guys wanna show them. Well, the owner of this car, that's exactly what his intention was. Take this car to as many shows as he can for a year, and then he's either gonna park it or he's gonna drive it. Well, the show, first show we went to was Cobo Hall, Detroit. How did the car do? Extremely well. One best restored convertible, outstanding restored overall, and best interior. The next show we went to, we went to Performance World. What did it win there? It won best in class. It won second overall for the entire show, considering it's, it's a hot rod show. That's pretty good. Usually the first five cars are hot rods. It also won best street machine, and it won best paint overall. Pretty nice for that, but the real test is going to be at the Pontiac Nationals. This summer in July in St. Louis, this car is going to be there. It's going to be judged with the best of the best. We'll see how it does there. Now Dave's going to take this car there and he's going to enjoy, hopefully, some of the judges saying this is right, this is wrong, this is right. The whole experience behind restoring a car is learning about the history of that car and how those cars went down the assembly line and how they were finished. And we don't know everything. The longer we're in this business, the less I realize that I know about restoring cars. There's so many little nuances, but it's nice that you learn every day from a lot of enthusiasts like you guys out there. Well, you guys have written in and said sometimes that we over restore cars. In some aspects we do. We're real particular about making sure the car's straight. We're real particular about having great paint on the car. As far as the detail, we do want those correct. Next year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually do three cars simultaneously and we're gonna pick highlights from each car so we can get more information to you, the viewer out there, and hopefully we get more response from you on what you wanna see if you email us at dreamcargarage.com. Let us know what you wanna see.